Thank you, Abbott, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, we started this program almost about uh, a year or so ago, right after FDA approval. And there are a lot of things that we learned uh, in the process. And I wanted to share my experience with it and how we adopted this and why has this technology became, become uh, the standard for us. So um, as everybody knows, the opportunity for left atrial appendage occlusion closure is just growing. Uh, it is a growing market and as more and more data comes out, we're realizing that uh, patients tend to do better as far as outcomes are concerned uh, with patients with atrial fibrillation uh, as with, with, with good closure of left atrium. Whether it's surgical data or interventional cardiology data, data looks really good. And what we expect over the next several years is this, um, uh, is this uh, procedure to go up in volume. It, right now it occupies the highest number of structural heart cases that are being done right now. But all of this comes with unmet clinical needs. If we decide to do a closure in a patient, a patient deserves that that closure is complete uh, because the risk of thromboembolic strokes actually worsen if you do incomplete closures. So it is our responsibility as physicians to understand these and give them the best therapy available. So in looking at left atrial appendage anatomy, uh, most of the left atrial appendage have multiple lobes. And a lot of times we're dependent on the devices that we use. And we're trying to close an eccentric structure device with a fixed structure um, um, closure device. And sometimes it runs into challenges. And that's where AMOLED device is able to offer things that we, that we weren't able to do previously. Uh, in, in this study, almost 54% of the left atrial appendage has had more than one lobe. And when you're encountering that, a lot of challenges happen. And then this study, uh, as showed by DJ, showed that this, some of these left atrial appendage are maybe very unsuitable for the commonly available watchman device. So, and device leaks a legacy concern for watchmen. From the previous data that was published, leaks as little as less than three, three to five millimeter have clinical significance. As we're learning more and more, any kind of leak is bad. Even small amount of leaks are now leading to more um, um, uh, bad prognostic uh, data. So uh, one of the goals that for a closure device is to absolutely make sure that the seal is complete. Uh, that kind of leaks are divided into minor, small, moderate, and large. Prior classification was large PDLs were greater than 10 millimeter, but as I indicated before, now our goal is to keep the leaks to less than one millimeter or non-existent. And how can we do that? Well, if you try to do single closure technique, which means you use a, use a device which only closes or fits one orifice, sometimes you will run into uh, uh, areas where, where circumferentially there may be a small leak. So hence, dual seal technology offered by AMOLED offers this additional protection that exists. And then combine this with a deflectable sheet that we have available, it gives operators such as me a little bit of working area where I can manipulate the, the device to actually sit in a way where I can close it from two different, um, um, two different areas. And I'll show you some examples of that. So the data for AMOLED looked really strong in the original IDE trial where there were almost about 2,000 randomized patients. Randomized between, and it was a bold trial because rather than going against uh, anticoagulation, they went directly ag ag uh, against a pre-existing approved watchman device. And the closure at 45 days and safety at 12 months was satisfactory. But more important was that the amount of leakage seen was significantly lower, and that makes sense. If you try to close an oblong device with single low, um, there are always gonna be challenges where you're gonna see leaks. But if you can somehow use the double seal technology, meaning the low plus the disc, you can, you can avoid a lot of these leaks. Here's an example of the different morphologies that we run into. And some of them are windsocks, some of them are double lobe. And then if you look at the top right corner, the double lobe, we, use the, and we commonly use this. We use the lobe to actually cover one of the lobes and then the disc to actually, which is the proximal segment, to cover the second lobe. And that way, there are no leaks. Now imagine closing this 
with a uh, single closure device. It, it can be extremely challenging. In addition, the widest range of sizes also ensure best LA fit. So this is our experience. We started this, uh, as I mentioned, almost about a year ago. And what we wanted to do is actually assess intraprocedural. So typically, uh, the workflow is that most patients get uh, CT scans before. We wanted to assess uh, uh, the left atrial appendage intraprocedurally, and for that we used um, intracardiac echo, we used angiography, and we used TEE without any um, CT scan done prior. So basically we took all comers. And as a background, I, I wanted to share our first experience of the first 25 uh, patients that we did in which none of them had any failure of device implantation, even without pre-screening. The point I'm trying to make is that if you know that you, you have uh, two, two levels of closure, you can probably take on any appendage that you would like to. Um, the other thing that we, we noted in this is uh, we were able to do, all of these patients had early ambulation, which means we you use closure devices in the groin and we were able to discharge them uh, really effectively. Uh, this, this data is submitted to CSI Frankfurt and um, we're probably gonna get more details of that at the time. We looked at the incidence of procedural complications. We looked at bleeding complications. We also looked at number of devices. Now remember, this is without any pre-operative screening, meaning no CT scan done prior. Number of devices needed per case we also looked at rate of hospitalization, stroke, and embolism. And these, all of these 26 patients, first 26 patients were followed and, uh, to, uh, for three months to assess the safety and efficacy. None of them had any bleeding complications. None of them had any pericardial effusions. None of them had any stroke, embolism, or, or, or hospitalization. More importantly, in most of these stations, we only ended up using single device. So measurement of device periprocedurally with a TE, intracardiac echo, or angiography, we were able to implant most of these patients with single device rather than having to take the device out, resize, put it back, and whatnot. There were only one or two patients where we had to use two devices in this case. This is an example of one of the cases which was sent as a watchman failure again. They never even... They actually tried to attempt it and uh, was never done. It came from the coast of Florida. Here you can see, on si based on size, uh, it looks quite small. But we were quite confident with the, with the double seal closure, we'll be able to get it. This is one of the several examples that we see almost every day. These are our T measurements, and again, these are perioperatively. This is a video which should probably play. And you can see. It's quite a, say, quite a small orifice. But one of the advantages of AMOLED devices is it does not require much depth. So you can place it quite superficially right past the circumflex. This is the angiogram. If I hit button, you should be able to see it. You can see how small it is, how, how many pectinate muscles there are, and rightly so, a standard Watchman Flex device would probably not sit out there. This is our implantation. You can see we were able to put the lobe in nicely with very good compression, and then we used the disc, which is the proximal portion of the device to cover the orifice. These are the TEEs post-procedure. We're actually, you can see, here I'm doing the tuck test on this device. I'm pulling it and making sure that it's stable. And the next picture, you can see the 3D where you can see the device is very well approximated around the tissue with no leaks. Now this patient we've been following now for a while and looks really good as well. These are kind of the summary of the case. So in my conclusion, the Amplats Amulet LA Occluder is a safe and effective alternative to oral anticoagulation for stroke uh, prevention. For our data, for our initial, which has now extended to almost more than 100 patients, there were no results of procedural complications, stroke emboli, or, or pericardial effusions. 
to a point that we're very comfortable discharging these patients same day. A long-term follow-up of these patients, of course, require um, um, multiple standard studies. And one of the questions which I want to raise over here that if I'm getting referrals for, for watchman failures for a procedure like this, and provided this may have a little bit of learning cur curve, why not use a double closure device as the first line of therapy? And, and that has become our standard of care as well. Because if you do a procedure enough, you get proficient in it, you get well uh, trained in it, and rather than waiting for a patient to fail other therapy and then bring them back, maybe it's a better idea to try this device as a first step. So I'm gonna stop over here and answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much for your attention. So I'm actually from Abbott. I'm on the global marketing team. And I like your perspective on how you pre-plan your patients prior to your implantation. So you mentioned you do some pre-CT. Can you comment a little bit about your other modalities that you use during your pre-planning? Yeah, so it's an ongoing discussion and that, you know, my, my ideas may get, may get shot, but there's, there's a completely different uh, field which feel that pre-planning CT and geography um, helps a lot, especially with certain software. For me personally, in my own experience, in my center's experience, and I'm willing to stick my neck out for this at this time, I, I know, I know, I know, she knows, she knows my perspective on this. But I need to be convinced a little bit that I'm adding something to my patient care by putting him through this complexity of coming in again, because everything is about efficiency. So coming to the hospital, getting a CT scan there, getting a process, and if I'm not using that data to do, or if it doesn't get translated properly to my perioperative care, it doesn't really matter to me. But having said that, there are operators who really, really rely on that heavily, and sometimes, including Devi, and sometimes they actually don't even look at peri procedure. For, for me, I'm able to close, in my personal experience, every appendage looking at what's happening during the procedure. So it doesn't really change how much I'm gonna impact. Because I use also ICE, okay? So I plan my transeptal puncture intraprocedurally, which means a lot of this depends on where you puncture the septum. And if you have intracardiac echo options, you can define the straight track where you're gonna puncture and go directly at, uh, at the appendage, and then size it either based on ICE in the left atrium, transesophageal echo, and a combination of angiography. But having said that, I'm not taking anything away from people who use the CT and use it well, but it hasn't added to my workflow yet. Good question. It's an ongoing discussion. And now we have more than 100 cases of this with successful closures with the amulet device with no pre-planned CT. No, no, go ahead. But you're the you marketing guy, you're important. No, 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 you're important. We're, we're very happy that you've joined us. I'd be curious to also understand what your post-drug uh, regime is with your dual, your, dual, your dual closure technology. What is your current post-drug regime for your patients? Is it yeah. DAPT, SAPT? I mean, what, what are you? Yeah, yeah, so post-closure with a dual is gonna be DAPT. So we use aspirin and Plavix. Now, I've done some leak closures and I've done some patients where the risk is really, really high because there's a lot of smoke. Because there's a case we did who was a failed uh, atri clip closure where there's so much smoke in that left atrium. Maybe it's not a bad idea to do low dose, no whack in those cases. So by low dose, we mean half a dose of Eliquis or half a dose of Xeralto for the first few months till endothelialization happens. But one of the things I'm really impressed with it, in this dual seal is when you do a TE on them three months later, uh, the, the way uh, the disc sits against their Coumadin ridge and mitral valve is really, really impressive. So the endothelialization is really smooth. Um, so that actually feels really good when, when, we, when we do this. So to the true value of this device, you see it in, in this 90 days TE. You feel good about it. As compared to you know, other products which are available in markets, sometimes the device is tilted like this, sometimes the device is tilted like that. It may be closed, 
but because of that shoulder, sometimes the endothelialization doesn't happen as nicely, or sometimes there may be a small leak here, small leak there, and then you're chasing your tail. Another point I wanted to make, which is very important, is the utilization of deflectible sheath for this double closure. Okay, so you're gonna run into challenging anatomies at all times. Now, if you have a fixed device and you're going into a variable anatomy, that fixed device is just gonna take that shape which is available. And there's very little operator skill that you could do to manipulate it. When you have a dual seal closure, and I don't wanna be pointing at you like I'm talking to you but I'm talking to everybody. When you do a dual seal closure, you fix the low where it anchors, but then you can use your sheath, your deflectible sheath, to put the disc right at where you wanna close the whole orifice. So I feel personally, I have so much more power in my hands to give a better closure out of the technology which is available at this time. Now, things may change as new things come out, but at this time, at least I have something that I can do for a difficult anatomy to make that closure work for the patient. Thank so you so I think much. It's, a, it's an integral part that people who are not comfortable with deflectable sheets utilize that deflectable sheet to your advantage. And I know electrophysiologists use deflectable sheets all the time, and they're very, very comfortable with it, but some of our interventionalist colleagues are not as, but there's a lot of value of using the sheet to put the disc where you want to. Good. Thank you so much, Dr. Siddiqui. Thank you, guys.